All right. I am here with David Perez, the chairman of New Mexico Angels. How's it going, David? Hey, good, Steve. Good to see you today. Thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah. I'm excited to really unpack your multiple exits here. But before we get into the nitty gritty, let's talk about your background. How did you get started in business and entrepreneurship? Yeah, I was, um, um, I grew up in New Jersey. My dad was actually an immigrant from Bolivia. He was a Quechua Indian, um, uh, came to the United States as a doctor and was always extremely entrepreneurial. It was sort of in his blood um, coming from that country. But I grew up in New Jersey and one of my first entrepreneurial acts was um, selling light bulbs for the Boy Scouts. My Boy Scout troop <clears throat> was looking to raise money. And I just went door to door in the neighborhood, knocking on doors, selling light bulbs, <laughs> of all things. And that sort of gave me the taste of, of selling and earning and interacting with people and not being afraid of, of doing that. So that, that really started me off. And when I uh, graduated university and um, was looking for my first you know, job, first career, I ended up at Dean Witter Reynolds as a stockbroker. And there was nothing more entrepreneurial than being given a chair and a telephone and training and say, go make a living. And it was extremely challenging. I loved it. Um, I, I love fishing. And so this is like hunting. You know, um, I did never really got discouraged by a no. And that training in my 20s really helped me when I was out starting my own businesses, raising capital. But um, I did a lot of cold calling as a stockbroker and uh, built a really nice business and learned a tremendous amount. And uh, of the the 75 or so people that I trained with by in 12 months after the initial training, about 25% were left. So a lot of people washed out and um, very, very challenging. And, uh, but that really gave me the, the training to go off and, and uh, eventually start my own business, uh, which I did in 1999. Nice. Very nice. It's incredible. The importance and the consistency around sales that come up in conversations that I have, like the, the, the vast majority, I would say, of entrepreneurs that I know and I've, I've talked to on this show have some background in sales. They've had experiences with, you know, some sales training. Some of them just, you know, go right out of high school to building huge businesses, uh, going door to door and things like that. And there's some sort of cool um, element there to just being able to sell yourself, sell products, services, and everything that's so underrated, I, I think, because so many people don't really emphasize it nowadays. Um, when there's oh, gosh. Your clear line of success there. I couldn't agree more. I mean, look, if, if you can't make a sale, you have no business. Yeah. You don't have revenue, you don't have a business. Revenues come from sales. And for you know entrepreneurs raising capital, those are their first sales. Because they're selling them, them themselves, they're selling their vision, they're selling their story to investors. So um, uh, you know these days after after these two exits, I've done a lot of advising of companies and consulting and in my role as a New Mexico Angels chair, I, I speak to a lot of startup entrepreneurs. And, you know, when I see some tech, you know, kind of tech entrepreneurs, whether they're a scientist, an academic, a doctor, an engineer, um, those are some of the first challenges they face is being able to sell themselves and their company's vision. Um, but also, you know, with sales comes rejection. Right. So how people deal with rejection is so important. <clears throat> and I learned pretty quickly that I never saw, you know, rejection as yeah, something, but I never took it personally. Um, I came up with this um, sort of saying to me that every no was throwing a log on the fire of my motivation. So every no would just stoke my motivation even more. Nice. Nice. And then it's just a never ending burning fire <laughs> oh, right putting, those, putting, the logs putting more logs on the fire yeah <laughs> 
That's really good. Really good saying. Keeps it, keeps it going, keeps it moving, keeps it moving. I really like that. Um, I guess yeah. let's talk about the first venture. I, I want to understand how that, that founding story began and how you kind of grew that business. Yeah. So this was 1999 in another century and uh, the internet was really, um, in its infancy still was really staking, taking off. And I had been working um, in some agencies that were building the first corporate websites back in the late nineties. And, um, you know, I wanted to start my own business. I didn't want to work for the man and was looking for sort of that, how would I do it? And I was actually sitting with a client, the Colgate Palmolive, and we were um, working on their first website. And the gentleman said, Hey, you know, guy like you should start a, um, a Hispanic agency. And I said, really, why? He said, well, you're, you're very good. You're very good at what you do. You're a real professional. And um, there's a real need for, um, for more work in that area. And that was sort of the light bulb that went off. And that night I went home and I was searching on the web. Again, this was very early days. And I saw that there were a number of Hispanic ad agencies. So these are ad agencies that buy Spanish language television and radio, basically. And at, at least it, it was pretty limited at that time. And there were no, none of these agencies had any website development capabilities. And I thought, wow, there, I've been involved in making websites since 92. I wanted to start my own business. I knew as much as there was about building websites. And at that time, a website cost a million dollars. Something that you and I could make with WordPress in probably a day and a half. Okay. Everything was done by hand, you know? And so um, I thought, well, wow, you know, I could really step off and start doing this. I hadn't had any real experience in Hispanic marketing as a kind of practice, but I love to learn and I'm a quick study. So um, I, my wife was pregnant with our first child. She was six months pregnant at the time and God bless her. She said, go do it. You know, what, what do you have to lose? Um, you know, you get called by headhunters once a week and if it doesn't work, you just get another job. And I said to myself, no way it's going to work. <laughs> I'm not going to go work for somebody else again. So I quit my job. Uh, Bruce Springsteen concert was a motivating event. I won't get too far into that, but, um, quit, quit my job. And, um, and I had started to call different companies in New York. So I was in New York city at the time. And, um, I had done some market research and I called uh, Chase, Chase Manhattan Bank asking for the multicultural marketing director and uh, was it was connected to a woman who and I introduced myself and said, hey, I'm doing research about the Spanish language marketing you're doing and if you're doing anything on the Internet. She said, yeah, we, we really want to build a website and do that, but our agency doesn't support that. Why are you calling? And I said, well, I'm building a, a Hispanic digital agency. And she said, well, I'd love to meet with you. So long story short, that was my first contract. It was a $25,000 contract with Chase. And I uh, went off and hired someone. I was sort of prepping, you know, everything and hired someone to execute the contract. And I went back out and sold <laughs> and uh, continued to sell. And uh, that was really the, the initiation of it all. Uh, my next client was Kraft Foods. And... Um, we got a very large, again, remember, websites cost a million dollars. And so the next contract was about a million dollars for to build their um, Hispanic website. And one of the things I always said in this space was um, the websites needed to be in Spanish and in English because there were lots of Latinos like me who grew up in the United States speaking English first and Spanish second. It's about culture. So I really created a niche where we were working with Fortune 100 companies who were looking to reach Hispanic consumers online. Nobody else had done it. And um, so that was really the beginning. Nice, nice. And you, you mentioned like right after that first $25,000 contract, you went out and hired somebody. How big did the team get like over the course of the, the trajectory leading to the exit? Yeah. So, you know, I started with that and, and early on, I, I met a gentleman who was raising a private equity fund or a venture fund to invest in Latin based Internet businesses. Again, 99. Um, and we joined forces and raised thirteen million eight hundred sixty five thousand um, dollars 
in about three months in Q4 of 99. And I remember the exact amount because we went to a ATM machine on December 23rd to check if the money had hit and it was $13,865,000. And we looked at each other and said, now what do we do? We were working out of Starbucks. And so, um, uh, so we, our, our strategy was we had the agency, which I had started. This fellow Peter came in raising the money. We joined forces and then we created an incubator. So we found a 25,000 square foot loft in Soho in Manhattan and um, invested in five companies. And we had to build the websites because they were all web-based businesses for all of those companies. We also acquired businesses in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and in Los Angeles, um, because we were building a pan-hemispheric um, agency. Um, the investors that first time were led by JP Morgan, um, their Latin American division. So it was a combination of building up this agency, incubating uh, companies, and acquiring companies in the region. So um, we did that. Timing in 99 was great to raise money. But when the clock ticked over to the year 2000 was when the dot-com you know, collapse started. And I was in, in, Buenos, or in Sao Paulo looking to buy a company. Whoops. Um, sorry about that. Um, looking to buy a company. When I got a call from a buddy of mine, I said, do you know what's going on in the stock market right now? And that's when the NASDAQ and the dot-coms became dot-bombs. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a rocky road. But... Um, we ended up raising another $10 million in, in, in 2000. And then, um, and uh, we we're off to the races. Nice. Very nice. And let's talk a little bit about the, the exit itself. How did, how did conversations begin with exiting after you'd raised that 10 and, and how long was that? Yeah, well, it, it was it, one thing, you know, you probably hear from a lot of entrepreneurs is that, uh, startup land and entrepreneurship's a roller coaster. And um, I rode a big roller coaster. So we're on top of the world, raise the money. We're buying these companies. The clients are coming in. We've got Kraft, um, Nike, the NFL, MTV, Nickelodeon, Wells Fargo, and others. And then um, these idiots flew airplanes into the World Trade Center on, on September 11th. And that changed the course of the business. Uh, we were in lower Manhattan. We weren't at ground zero, but we were in what was called the exclusionary zone below 14th street. And uh, we weren't able to go to our offices for weeks. And this was before Zoom, before Google Docs, before anything like that. And uh, the resulting recession that came out of that really hit uh, multicultural marketing very hard. So. That was sort of a knife in our side uh, of our business, and it was very, very challenging. Um, then Brazil went into a pretty deep recession, and that business suffered dramatically. And then Argentina went into an economic depression, um, which uh, really negatively affected us. So we actually had to wind down the business. Um, and now we're talking around 2006, I think, 2005. And um, out of that, I basically started um, another business called Latin Force, and I just focused on the United States. My child, I had two children were very young. I was traveling all over the hemisphere, didn't want to do that anymore, and, um, and continued that business. And then Goldman Sachs um, uh, approached me about investing. And at that time, I was really looking to expand uh, my business, my agency business, in a broader footprint. So if you're familiar with companies like Omnicom or WPP, they're holding companies of many advertising and marketing types of companies. There was no multicultural version of that. So I had the vision to create a multicultural Omnicom, if you will, to sell to Omnicom ultimately. And Goldman Sachs, um, meeting with the folks there, I laid out this kind of matrix of all the different companies I knew in the space and, and uh, that were dealing with Hispanic advertising or African-American and Asian and said, we can put all this together. And they fellow sat back in the Goldman Sachs way and said, you know, we have more money than God, right? Would you like to go shopping with our checkbook? I said, sounds good to me. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. I, I like the, the positioning 
um, the positioning there. So what, uh, what kind of deal structure was it? Was there, did you have to, to go over to the acquiring company? Did you have to stay there for a while? Did the whole team come? Did part of the team leave? How did that work out? Yeah. I mean, I basically, we shut down Lumina in essence. Okay. I created Latin force uh -huh. and basically I bought those accounts from Lumina, if you will. Right. Uh -huh. If you want to get into the technical aspect of this, right. I had my team and I, and I, I kept going and then I had a payout to pay back the investors for the accounts I had. And I ran that without any investor capital. And then a couple of years later, Goldman comes, comes and we have that conversation and, and um, I was very intrigued. So then, um, what Gold, what we did with Goldman was basically I, my company was the acquiring company of others. So there was a data analytics company that I had my eyes on and I was really interested in data and, and was sort of early in that seeing that it was really meant data internet was going to be inextricably linked with data driving really the marketing online. And this uh, company had very interesting data on geodemographic data. So they could identify by zip code, the um, race and ethnicity and language preferences in those particular zip codes. So it was very handy when it came to uh, multicultural marketing. Um, so we acquired that business in a $20 million transaction um, with Goldman financing that, <clears throat> financing that. And, you know, I had already been around the block once on raising capital with institutional investors and for you know the listeners who have been involved in this, there's um, something called the cap table and waterfall, which I learned the hard way about, and something called a ratchet. Um, so you know raising capital is based on what are your financial projections, and if you don't meet some of those projections, then you could get diluted down in your equity if you go back for a second round. And in, in Lumina, we had that experience, and so the investors had preferred stock. And I, as a founder, had common stock. So now you come to the Goldman Sachs situation with my company, Latin Force. They were proposing a similar preferred common structure. And I said, nope, I'm not going to do that deal. I got screwed last time. And because I didn't know any better, honestly, it was my first time. And so um, I told them that I would only do the deal if we all had common stock. I said, I want us around the table with the same security with the same, no other preferences for anyone else. We're all in this together. And surprisingly, they agreed <laughs> to do that. Um, so that was actually a pretty big win. Nice. Very nice. Very nice. So shifting gears, what was the uh, next venture that led to the exit? Because you've had two. So okay. So, yeah, right. So Latin Force, so we're executing there for a few years. Um, uh, the transactions and I buy that company in 20, 2007. Um, that summer, these words called subprime debt became part of the vernacular and my macro timing, not so great. Um, 2008 rolls around, Lehman goes bust in September of 2008. Goldman says, hey man, this is a terrible environment. We can't buy companies. They put their checkbook away. And um, so it was about a year after that, that I exited that business and the fellow who I bought actually bought me out mm -hmm. and bought my shares out um, of the business. And that's when I left New York and I moved to Santa Fe. Um, so that was sort of like an inside exit, if you will. Um, and that was, you know, it wasn't the dreams of glory that I had. And, uh, that's a longer conversation with entrepreneurs. You know, they don't, you don't all end up with the G4 in the parking garage. Um, but um, that enabled me to move on and then move to Santa Fe with my family. And I, I, I knew, I say I knew or I thought I had another company in me. And um, I wasn't sure what that would be. But then when I moved to Santa Fe, I started working with some venture capital firms that asked me to step in as interim CEO for some businesses and help them you know, position and, and sell those businesses. So I, I, I've done some exits for other companies as well. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard the buyout exit um, actually becoming a lot, lot more common uh, over the last few years. And I think it's, 
it is an underrepresented one. Not many people talk about it that much. Uh, they don't really even associate it, but it is very much for the founder because everybody's in different chapters of their lives. And it, it is a really um, good good way to go in, in my experience. And I think one big topic that always comes up is around timing. Now, we've gone through the 2001 and we've gone through the uh, you know 2008 situations here. So your roller coaster is going pretty wild. But what tips could you give around the right time to sell a business to entrepreneurs? Well, gosh, you know, ideally is when your company's growing, right? You know, where you have really good growth, year over year growth. Um, ideally, you're profitable. Um, you know, it's all about relative strength. So, you know, if, if you're growing 50% year over year or more, you've got EBITDA positive, you've got a strong position in the market, you've got great IP protection, and um, you identify a strategic, i.e. another company that would buy your company to build out a new product line, for instance, and that's my second exit, which I can get into. Um, that really is quite common um, versus a financial buyer and that's generally much like private equity or generally buying cash flow um, yeah. for other businesses. And, you know, if you're into the multi hundreds of millions of dollars of, of um, size, um, that's sort of that world of private equity buyouts. Yeah. Um, but happy to get into the next company, which really kind of fits the strategic exit mold. Yeah, let's talk about it. What, what was it? And, and how yeah. Was so, you know, I came to Santa Fe and I was just said to myself, you know, I want to figure out another company to, to start. I wanted to build a brand. So as an agency, I had great clients, but I really didn't control what they did in any way, shape or form. I'd give them a recommendation to do X, Y, Z, and they'd either say, Hey, yes, let's do it. Or yeah, you know, we're going to do something different. And, um, you know, that was a little frustrating to me. So I wanted to build my own brand and a product. I didn't know what that would be, but I wanted it to be something that was going to be, have a positive impact on a lot of people and really do something no one had done before. Um, do something no one had done before. Let's remember that. It's not always the best to be first. Mm -hmm. um, and so in uh, 2011, early 2011, I'm sitting in my doctor's office filling out paper forms that I had filled out a few months before, seven sheets of paper, writing my name, address, date of birth on every single sheet of paper and um, getting very frustrated with it. And I talked to the gal behind the front desk and she's got a stack of these forms that she's manually entering into a computer. And I was an early adopter of the iPad and I had an iPad in my lap and I'm typing an email and I just thought, huh, that this iPad could be a, the digital clipboard, if you will, capture that information. That gal's typing into a computer. There's gotta be a way to get this data into that computer, you know, over uh, Wi-Fi or the internet. I didn't know anything more than that. I was a disgruntled customer of healthcare. So I, I hand in the, the clipboard and it's got the pen attached by paper clips with a flower, plastic flower taped on it. You've seen those before. Uh -huh. And um, and I show her the iPad and I said, what do you think if I fill this out here? And she asked, would it mean I don't have to type anymore? And I said, yes. She says, when could I have it? So I sit down in the waiting room and with my marketing hat on, I see a captive audience in a contextually relevant setting, about 20 people were there. Some are on their phones, others are watching the TV with the volume shut off, and others are reading a six month old magazine. No one's looking at the brochures about asthma, diabetes, and hypertension. And I thought, I have an iPad in their lap. I know their name, age, date of birth, um, zip code they're in, and the medical specialty. I could create a magazine on the internet that would um, specifically relate to their gender and age and serve them health and wellness information while they're in the waiting room because the average wait time is 23 minutes. And it could perform a educational piece because that person's actually thinking about their healthcare in that moment. They're not watching the ball game. They're not watching the news. And so I thought I could um, tailor that marketing message. And so that was the concept of seamless medical systems. And I left the, the waiting room. My brain was spinning. I called my brother, who was a doctor. And I said, Tim, what do you think about replacing all the paper forms patients fill out in the doctor's office with an iPad? 
And he said, immediately, every medical practice will need that. So that launched me on the path for seamless medical systems. And um, I'm not a programmer, but um, I wrote the first check. My brother wrote the second check. and I went off to hire a programmer to come up and build out this vision I had for this uh, product, which became what was called a patient engagement platform. Nice. And um, as probably many of your entrepreneurs know, and you've heard, this endeavor was far more complicated and difficult than I ever imagined, took far longer than I ever imagined, and cost much more money than I ever imagined. Um, yeah. But um, the roller coaster continued. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, I started developing the product. Um, I actually uh, left Santa Fe. I went down to Phoenix for a couple of days and I walked into uh, 97 medical practices and interviewed, had interviews with 46 of them to basically test the concept of a digital check-in platform. And I went on Google Maps and we just looked for like a medical office because, you know, as you know, they're kind of all bunched together in certain buildings or office parks. And, and um, I had a shirt on. I worked with this other company that had like a little shirt on and a cap. And I had an iPad, which I was collecting all the data on. And so that, um, you know, creating product market fit, you know, was so critical. And that was an absolutely important exercise for me to do because I walked into OBGYN offices, which as a guy, I don't spend any time in, right? And I noticed those waiting rooms were just covered with all kinds of brochures and, and information. I walked into plastic surgery offices where they had someone, you know, a barista operating a coffee machine with a fountain. You know, I walked into a Medicaid office where there were chairs where people would be handcuffed to the metal chair. So I saw everything and everywhere in between. I grew up, my father was a doctor, my mom was a nurse, but I didn't pursue healthcare. So that exercise of understanding what's the environment and the people behind the desk who are working with this was mm -hmm. absolutely critical. Yeah, well, also we've kind of gone through two very different businesses, right? That you, that you started and exited. So that kind of takes us to the finale of knowing what you know now, what would you tell David 10 years ago? Yeah. So I could just, just, so anyway, I grow the business, seamless medical, get distribution. We're in uh, urgent cares and retail clinics. Target was our big break. And in 2016, I get a call from a company I'd been um, trying to work with as a partner. And the CEO says, hey, David, we've been trying to build what you guys built, but we've been unsuccessful. How about we buy you? And they matched our product. We had an outpatient product in the clinics. They had a product at the bedside and hospitals. And I sold that business in 2017. Nice. So that was, that was a strategic exit. Um, worked out pretty well. And, um, and then since then, I've been working with other companies to help them exit, which I've done a few. But knowing what I know now, 10 years later, man, um, you know, I think some of the things were confirmed. Keep throwing the logs of rejection on the fire of motivation. Keep doing that. Everything takes far longer than you ever imagined starting a business. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the lessons I've learned, uh, I've learned because I've been consulting with a lot of other companies or advising them. and understanding the go-to-market product market fit what's the customer really need and the go-to-market plan is so important particularly when you have technical people starting companies where this is not their you know their uh, strength and knowledge so having that worked out before you go into it and then the last thing i would say is you know there's a saying begin with the end in mind mm -hmm. so if you're building a company, and I did this with Seamless Medical, in my first business plan, I listed the companies who I thought would buy it. None of those on the list ultimately bought it, but that I, I was building to exit, Yeah. right? I wasn't building to own it forever. So b begin with the end in mind and start with that. Who's that exit going to be to? How big do you need to get the company to to do that? And then create that plan to, to move forward. Well said. Well said. Well, where can people learn more about what you're working on now? 
Oh, geez, I, I haven't set that up. I'm just coming, um, just launching. I'm, I'm in New Mexico. We're an energy state. And I'm actu actually launching something called the Advanced Energy Alliance and uh, really helping the, um, the economy of New Mexico um, create uh, energy, or energy around <laughs> advanced energy and build our economy. I'm really working on economic development issues right now, Steve, uh, versus starting an individual company. So really helping drive and position New Mexico as a energy leader for the United States uh, and, and the rest of the world. Very cool. So LinkedIn maybe is where people LinkedIn, David Perez on LinkedIn. Yeah. Come see me on LinkedIn. Beautiful. All right. Well, wherever you guys are listening on iTunes or Spotify, the links that David mentioned will be in the show notes, but thank you so much, David, for coming on and sharing your multiple exits and your story. Well, Steve, thanks so much for inviting me. It was really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.